Good morning, everyone, and a very warm welcome to our online service. We're going to begin by singing a great hymn of the church, Jesus Shall Reign. And this song comes as a wonderful reminder that Jesus, the crucified, risen and ascended King, reigns supreme. He reigns supreme over all things. He reigns over every aspect of our nation. He reigns over every aspect of our church. And he reigns over every aspect of our lives as well. We're not in the hands of fate, but rather we're in the loving arms of the one who loved us and gave himself for us. Well, as we begin, I'll pray. Heavenly Father, we praise you for the great saviour you have provided for us in your son, the Lord Jesus. That after he had died for our sins on the cross, he rose again. And that after he had risen, he was exalted to the highest place, to your right hand. At a time like this, when everything seems so very uncertain, we rejoice that every aspect of the life of our nation, our church family, and our own lives as well, are under the loving, wise, perfect, tender and compassionate rule of the Lord Jesus. Forgive us for the times this week when we have not submitted to the loving rule of King Jesus, for the times we have thought, said and done things that we shouldn't have. Forgive us, Lord. Father, forgive us for the times when we have doubted the loving rule of King Jesus leading us to fret and worry. Forgive us, Lord. Father, our prayer is that having participated in this online service, singing your praises, speaking to you in prayer, listening to your voice in your words, we would leave with a greater desire to obey you, to trust you and to live for you and you alone. Amen. Well, let's sing Jesus Shall Reign. Jesus shall reign
over the last two months or so, the elders, the deacons and the staff team have been working very hard, making all of the necessary preparations so that we can begin meeting again at Hall Cross. Our plan is to meet again at Hall Cross from Sunday the 4th of October. Inevitably, meeting together will feel very different compared with six months ago. Um, numbers will be limited. Uh, there'll be certain things that we're unable to do, but it will be a real joy, nevertheless, to be able to meet together again. Well, in the next week or so, we're going to be sharing more information about the fourth, um, what to expect, how to prepare, how to book a place, etc. Uh, but in the meantime, please, would you continue to be praying for uh, the staff team, uh, the elders and the deacons, as all of the, the final preparations are made. Uh, for many years now as a church family, we've supported the work of Operation Christmas Child, providing uh, shoeboxes filled with goodies for needy children throughout the world. Well, once again, this is taking place this year, although slightly differently. Uh, this year, everything will be done online. Uh, you choose your gifts and you pack your box, but you do it all electronically. Uh, the, the, the website explains far more details and there will be a, a link to that uh, at the end of the service. Uh, but now we're going to watch just a short video that introduces us to the work of Operation Christmas Child and afterwards Lee Potts, one of our elders, will lead us in prayer. The children are completely overjoyed. It's a real celebration. So many smiles on their faces. Smiles are all over. Yeah, these kids behind me are so excited because they've just received their boxes. Kids are so excited. Giving them a gift, do it in Jesus' name. That's what this is all about. Operation Christmas Child is about expressing the love of God. It's its wonderful way to enter into the Christmas spirit in its true meaning. Operation Christmas Child has grown hugely over 30 years since it started here in Britain, but now it is a worldwide project to send millions of shoeboxes all over the world. That's what I love about Operation Christmas Child. It knows no borders, it knows no boundaries. It's all about sharing the name of Jesus Christ. So the shoebox journey essentially starts from people in their home packing shoeboxes full of essential items like a toothbrush, some school supplies. Toys and gifts, hygiene items, so there's a real mix. I love choosing the things to go in a shoebox. I like to think about what a child would enjoy receiving. Father, we commit these boxes to you as they start their journey. All sorts of people can help with Operation Christmas Child. It's families, it's churches, it's hundreds of thousands of volunteers that help make Operation Christmas Child so successful. It's so encouraging having people coming into the church, bringing their boxes. Everybody out there who packs shoe boxes, they are spreading God's love. Some of them go by train, some go by camels, some go by ships. These boxes go all over the world, and that is only the beginning. So when the children have got their boxes, they are invited to take part in something called The Greatest Journey. Which is a 12-lesson discipleship program where they learn about the greatest gift, which is Jesus Christ. After a child completes The Greatest Journey, they graduate and receive a certificate and a Bible in their own language. When the light of the gospel is turned on, it makes everything new. 
Operation Christmas Child opens doors for people to discover what is the greatest gift of all, the love of God through Jesus. It is impacting children. It is impacting families. It is impacting the world greatly. I really encourage you to pack a shoebox and get involved with Operation Christmas Child. Lives are being changed all over the world. It's brilliant. We will now spend some time in prayer. We're going to pray about Samaritan's Purse's Operation Christmas Child work. We'll also pray about children's and young people's work within the church. This will be following up from Mike's uh, prayer evening on Tuesday. And then we'll also pray for the students as they return to university over the next few weeks. So let us pray. Lord Jesus, we come to you today and thank you for the privilege of praying for others. We know how powerful prayer can be. Lord, we ask that you would cleanse our hearts and show us clearly your ways. We thank you that through your name we can boldly come before you and pray with confidence. We know you listen to your children's prayers. Lord, we lift up to you Samaritan's Purse's Operation Christmas Child. We thank you that thousands of shoeboxes are ch distributed to children every year. We thank you for the blessings and the joy this gives to children who receive them. We pray that with the difficulties of this year, it will not impede the distribution of the boxes to the needy children. We thank you for the many volunteers around the world who help to get the boxes to the right place at the right time. Lord, we pray that you will use the Greatest Journey programme so that thousands of children can hear and understand the greatest salvation message. Lord, we pray for the teachers who deliver this, this programme. We pray for finances, that they will be in place so teachers can be trained to deliver the programme. Lord, we lift up our community and our church in Bessica. We pray that you will help us to influence others for good. Help us to be salt and light, pointing others to you. We pray, Lord, that you will deepen our love for you and for those that we come into contact with. Lord, we pray for children and young people. We lift up to you all the children linked to our church. In these times when face-to-face -face work is difficult, Lord, we pray, Lord, that you will give wisdom to Mike and the other leaders as they produce materials for the children and the young people. We pray that each and every child, from the youngest to the eldest, will engage with your word. Lord, we pray in particular for the children who come to used to come to the Excite and Ignite groups, Lord, where there's been minimal contact. Lord, we pray for miracles in this situation. Lord, that we pray even though the contact is small, Lord, that we pray that your word may be read by these children in whatever way it can be. Lord, we pray for the parents of these children, that they will be a positive influence upon the, the children. So, Lord, we just lift up all the work that's going on uh, within the church, working with young people and children. Lord, we think also about the students going back to university. Lord, we pray, Lord, after a number of months off from their university places, Lord, that you will help them to link in with their friends. Lord, we pray that you will provide them with the right friends, uh, good friends, Lord. We also pray that they will link in with the, a church, Lord, and they will be active within the church and really learn about you in the, in the church environment. We also pray for their involvement in CU. Lord, we pray that they will go along to CU and really be active and involved within the, the CU. We pray for the CU leaderships at all the universities around the country, Lord, that they will be real positive places of where the gospel is taught, where you are worshipped, Lord. Lord, we pray for the CUs as they endeavour to put on events to teach people about Jesus, Lord. We pray in these difficult times where it's difficult for people to meet up together, Lord, that you will allow this to happen in many different ways, whether it's in small groups, in halls of residences, in colleges, Lord, wherever it may be, Lord, we pray that your word will be proclaimed in the universities around the country. So, Lord, we just think of all our young people who are going off to university. We pray you'll bless them and you'll be with them 
as they go from Doncaster to the different places across the country. Lord Jesus, we have many needs, but we know you are adequate for every need. Your name is powerful and great, so we pray in your name, Jesus' name. Amen. chapter 4 Ezra chapter 4 When the enemies of Judah and Benjamin heard that the exiles were building a temple for the Lord the God of Israel they came to Zerubbabel and to the heads of the families and said let us help you build because like you we seek your God and have been sacrificing to him since the time of Esarhaddon, king of Assyria, who brought us here. But Zerubbabel, Joshua, and the rest of the heads of the families of Israel answered, You have no part with us in building a temple to our God. We alone will build it for the Lord, the God of Israel, as King Cyrus, the king of Persia, commanded us. 
Then the peoples around them set out to discourage the people of Judah and make them afraid to go on building. They bribed officials to work against them and frustrate their plans during the entire reign of Cyrus king of Persia and down to the reign of Darius king of Persia. At the beginning of the reign of Xerxes, they lodged an accusation against the people of Judah and Jerusalem. And in the days of Artaxerxes, king of Persia, Bishlam, Mithradath, Tabil and the rest of his associates wrote a letter to Artaxerxes. The letter was written in Aramaic script and in the Aramaic language. Rehum, the commanding officer, and Shimshai, the secretary, wrote a letter against Jerusalem to Artaxerxes, the king, as follows. Rehum, the commanding officer, and Shimshai, the secretary, together with the rest of their associates, the judges, officials and administrators over the people from Persia, Uruk and Babylon, the El Elamites of Susa and the other people whom the great and honourable Ashurbanipal deported and settled in the city of Samaria and elsewhere in Trans-Euphrates. This is a copy of the letter they sent him. To King Artaxerxes, from your servants, the men of Trans-Euphrates, the king should know that the people who came up to us from you have gone to Jerusalem and are rebuilding that rebellious and wicked city. They are restoring the walls and repairing the foundations. Furthermore, the king should know that if this city is built and its walls are restored, no more taxes, tribute or duty will be paid and eventually the royal revenues will suffer. Now, since we are under obligation to the palace, and it is not proper for us to see the king dishonoured, we are sending this message to inform the king, so that a search may be made in the archives of your predecessors. In these records you will find that this city is a rebellious city, troublesome to kings and provinces, a place with a long history of sedition. That is why this city was destroyed. We inform the king that if this city is built, and its walls are restored, you will be left with nothing in Trans-Euphrates. The king sent this reply. To Rehum, the commanding officer, Shimshai the secretary, and the rest of their associates living in Samaria and elsewhere in Trans-Euphrates. Greetings. The letter you sent us has been read and translated in my presence. I issued an order and a search was made and it was found that this city has a long history of revolt against kings and has been a place of rebellion and sedition. Jerusalem has had powerful kings ruling over the whole of Trans-Euphrates and taxes, tribute and duty were paid to them. Now issue an order to these men to stop work so that this city will not be rebuilt until I so order. Be careful not to neglect this matter. Why let this threat grow to the detriment of the royal interests? As soon as the copy of the letter of King Artaxerxes was read to Rehum and Shimshai the secretary and their associates, they went immediately to the Jews in Jerusalem and compelled them by force to stop. Thus, the work on the house of God in Jerusalem came to a standstill until the second year of the reign of Darius, king of Persia. This weekend sees the start of the new football season. The old one has barely finished, but the new one is starting. And as teams prepare to play a match, they can't just focus on themselves and their tactics and how they're going to play. They also need to do their opposition research. They need to look at how their opponents have played in the past, the kind of tactics their opponents have used in the past, so that they can know how their opponents are going to play in the upcoming match. Well, for God's people, Satan is the enemy. He is the opponent that we are up against, the accuser of God's people. He hates God and he is desperate to do all he can to thwart God's plans. And so God's people, like a football team, well, we need to do our opposition research. We need to be prepared. We need to study Satan's tactics that he's used in the past so that we can be wise to his schemes in the present. 
And Ezra 4 is like a kind of highlights package of tactics that Satan used to try to disrupt the rebuilding of God's temple. And so as we study Ezra 4 today, we can see how the, the tactics Satan used in the past, and we can be wise to see the sort of tactics he's going to use today. Now, the eagle-eyed amongst you will have noticed as we read Ezra 4 that Satan's not even mentioned by name, is he? And that's because Satan rarely acts in broad daylight. He prefers to operate in the shadows, behind the scenes. He doesn't really like to draw attention to himself. And so most of the time he uses people and circumstances to try and derail God's plans. And that's what he does here in Ezra 4 with the rebuilding of the temple. Just to give us a quick little recap of where we are in the story. After decades of exile, God's people have finally been allowed to go home to Jerusalem. King Sidus made a proclamation that they could go home. And so the people have been able to go home to rebuild the temple of the Lord. The temple was the place where God dwelt amongst his people. So you can see straight away, can't we, why Satan would want to disrupt this building project. He doesn't want God and his people dwelling together. He doesn't want God worshipped as God deserves. No, he wants to disrupt it. Well, today, God's building project is not a building in the Middle East, but his temple building project is his people, the church, built on the Lord Jesus Christ as people come in faith to him. Again, we can see that Satan wants nothing more than to disrupt this building project. He wants to stop people from coming to the Lord Jesus and, from, and then to stop them from living and worshipping the Lord Jesus. And so we need to do our oppo opposition research today. And Ezra chapter 4 gives us that chance. It shows us some of the tactics Satan used then, so we can be wise to the tactics he may use today. Here's the first tactic that we see in Ezra 4. The opposition targeted the leaders of God's people and tried to bring the temple down from inside. They targeted the leaders to try and bring the temple down from inside. Let's look at verses 1 to 3. When the enemies of Judah and Benjamin heard that the exiles were building a temple for the Lord, the God of Israel, they came to Zerubbabel and to the heads of the families and said, let us help you build, because like you, we seek your God and have been sacrificing to him since the time of Esadun, king of Assyria, who brought us here. But Zerubbabel, Joshua and the rest of the heads of the families of Israel answered, You have no part with us in building a temple to our God. We alone will build it for the Lord, the God of Israel, as King Cyrus the king of Persia commanded us. Got to say, at first, these people who come to the Jewish leaders, they seem really friendly. They seem generous. They seem like fellow believers wanting to help out. So why do the Jewish leaders reject their help? Frankly, with a building project like this, surely they need all the help they can get. Well, there's a few clues for why they reject their help if we look really carefully. Look first at verse 1. Jewish leaders see through the smiles. They see that these people are really enemies of Judah and Benjamin. Again, second, look carefully at exactly what these people say in verse 2. They came and they said, Let us help you build, because like you, we seek your God, and have been sacrificing to him since the time of Esadan, king of Assyria, who brought us here. Notice they don't say we worship the Lord. They don't use his covenant name. They say we seek your God. And that's because these people weren't Jewish. They were descendants of immigrants who had been brought into the region about 200 years ago by this Assyrian king, Esadon. And according to 2 Kings 17 verse 33, these newcomers were told they worship the Lord but they also served their own gods in accordance with the customs of the nations from which they'd been brought. And this is a problem because the Lord had been clear, you shall have no other gods before me. 
and you must worship me according to what I have said in Scripture. So the Jewish leaders, Zerubbabel, Joshua and the others, they see the danger of accepting the help of these people because they know that whoever builds the temple will then want to say in the worship of the temple once it's complete. Satan knows that the best way to disrupt and derail God's temple project and to rob God of the worship he deserves was from inside. Similarly today, Satan knows that the best way to damage the church is from the inside. And so churches, and especially church leaders, need to be very careful about who we appoint to positions of authority and teaching. We need to be very careful about who we partner with. Jesus warns us to watch out for wolves in sheep's clothing. And he says that we will spot them by their fruit, by what they say, what they teach, and also how they live. So just because people are friendly, just because they are helpful, generous, just because they claim to worship Jesus, well, sadly, it isn't enough. We need to ask the question, which Jesus do you worship? The Jesus of Scripture, who is holy, who cannot tolerate sin, who warns people of hell, who calls everyone to repent and believe and put their trust in him? Or do you worship the Jesus of your own invention? A Jesus who does tolerate sin. A Jesus who affirms everyone and every lifestyle, just as long as you're being true to yourself. Do you worship a Jesus who never calls you to repent? I think, arguably, the UK church today across the country is weak. Not because we've faced persecution from outside, but because of sin and false teaching from within. I think if you look at the, the history of the church in the UK over the last hundred years or so, you can see that increasingly we have adopted a liberal attitude to Scripture. Increasingly we deny the authority of Scripture. We cut out the bits of the Bible that don't fit in with our 21st century thinking and morality. Oh yes, there is still much talk of Jesus. But sadly, this Jesus is often not the Jesus revealed in Scripture. Throughout the ages, one of Satan's main tactics to, is to target the leaders of God's people and to try to bring God's building project down from inside. You see that actually in the Gospels, don't you? As Satan attacks, he targets Jesus. First, when Jesus is a baby, as Herod tries to kill the baby Jesus in Bethlehem. And then when Jesus is a man and Satan seeks to tempt him in the wilderness. Satan knew if he could take out Jesus, well, then the whole salvation project comes crumbling down. Again, Satan targets church leaders today. In the last couple of years, sadly, we have seen high profile cases of church leaders found to have been abusive or where their moral failure has been rightly exposed. And the failure of these leaders, often public and high profile, does great damage not only to the reputation of the church and the Lord Jesus, but, but to the building of the church. And so now, as then, well, God's people need wise, godly leaders who will courageously stand up for the truth to protect the church. And so can I say, I am not ashamed to ask you to pray for those of us who serve on the staff team or as elders or as deacons. Please pray that we would be as godly and wise and discerning and bold as Zerubbabel, Joshua and the others. Because Satan often targets leaders as he tries to bring down the church from within. But then as we move on into verses 4 and 5, we see the second tactic that the opposition use. And here we see the opposition target all God's people and apply constant pressure year after year. Let's read verses 4 and 5. Then the people around them set out to discourage the people of Judah and make them afraid to go on building. 
They bribed officials to work against them and frustrate their plans during the entire reign of Cyrus, king of Persia, and down to the reign of Darius, king of Persia. Here we see the, the sheep's wool slip. And these people are seen for the wolves that they really were. Because true worshippers of the Lord, well, they would rejoice to see the temple of God being built, regardless of who is building it. But when these wolves, when they can't get inside, well, they attack all the sheep, not just the leaders. Again, we see that pattern, I think, in the Gospels. When Satan can't get at Jesus, he turns his attention to the disciples. He causes Judas to betray Jesus. And in Luke, we read Jesus telling the disciples that Satan has tried to sift all the other disciples too. I think we see this same pattern again around the world. Where persecution is rife, pastors are often the first targets. But when that doesn't work, the persecution quickly spreads to all God's people. Here in Ezra 4, the opponents launch a campaign of intimidation. They, they try to wear God's people down so that God's people become discouraged and afraid and, and eventually just give up and stop building. And, and have a look at verse 5. Because according to verse 5, this wearing down, this grinding down went on for years. It started under King Cyrus and it continued on until the reign of King Darius. That's roughly about 15 years. Imagine that. 15 years of unrelenting pressure and intimidation, day in, day out, year in, year out, grinding you down so you want to give up. Well, sometimes, sometimes as we look around the world, as we look through history, we see that Satan he tries to stop the church with, with sudden, with violent persecution, the kind of equivalent of a sledgehammer blow. But other times, like here, he tries to wear God's people down, slowly and steadily, over years and years, with unrelenting pressure. In that sense, then, it's a bit like the way, uh, like a slow-moving glacier, and the way that that slow-moving glacier exerts pressure on the rocks underneath, year on year, the pressure just constant and building until eventually the rock cracks and crumbles. It is also, to change the picture, a little bit like the fable of boiling a frog, you know how that goes. The idea being if you drop a frog into boiling water, the frog will immediately jump out. But put a frog into tepid water and then slowly bring the water up to the boil. And the frog is unaware of the danger until it's too late. Well, it's that unrelenting pressure that seems, in my mind at least, to be the tactic that Satan most often uses on the church here in the UK. Because by and large, let's be honest, we have not faced the, the sledgehammer of persecution that some of our other brothers and sisters around the world do face. Instead, for decades... We have faced the constant, steady, glacial pressure of living in a society that has been slowly growing harder and harder to biblical Christianity. In a sense, as a church in the UK, we have spent decades swimming against the tide. And you will know if you've done that, if you've swum in the sea against the tide, when you do it for a long time, you eventually just feel worn out. And you, even though you're still swimming, you've come to a halt. And I think that that's a picture in many ways of the church in the UK today. Years of swimming against the tide has left many of us feeling discouraged, timid, exhausted. We've kind of swum to a standstill. No longer really trying to, to reach out and, and evangelise with the gospel. Instead, just happy to keep to ourselves and protect what we've got. Here then are some of the opposition's tactics. First, target the leaders and try to bring it down from inside. Then, second, target all the people and apply constant pressure year after year. But then third, target the authorities and use exaggeration and slander 
to turn them against God's people. And that's the tactic we see right from verse 6 through to verse 23. Now, the chronology of these verses can be a little bit confusing. And that's because in these verses, we get several different examples of how the opposition lobby different Persian kings to stop the rebuilding work. And what's a little bit confusing is that these examples are taken from, from a period of time of almost 100 years. So they include opposition, not just during the rebuilding of the temple under King Cyrus and King Darius, but also then opposition that came later when God's people were trying to rebuild the walls under King Xerxes and Artaxerxes. But what the writer of Ezra does is he groups all of these examples of opposition together because he wants to try and give us a sense of the unrelenting opposition that God's people faced the way that their opponents were constantly lobbying the the Persian kings. And they want to give us a sense of why the temple building project ultimately came to a halt. And that's what happens. We we have a look, chapter 4, verse 24, after giving us all these different examples of how uh, the authorities were lobbied to, to stop the building work. Verse 24 we read, Thus the work on the house of God in Jerusalem came to a standstill until the second year of the reign of Darius, king of Persia. So all of these different examples are here to give us a sense of the the political lobbying that went on to halt the building work. And most of the section is taken up with one letter written by two men, Uh, Rehan and Shimshai to King Artaxerxes. And and this seems to be highlighted as as a classic example of the sort of tactics and lobbying that was going on throughout this period. And and here's the first thing that these these two uh, men, Rehan and Shimshai did. Well, they exaggerated their support. Uh, Just look down to verse 9 and have a look at the long list of co-signatories that they give. Verse 9, they talk about officials and administrators of the people from Persia, Uruk and Babylon, the Elamites of Susa and the other people whom the great and honourable Ashurbanal deported and settled in the city of Samaria and elsewhere in the trans-Euphrates. And they're trying to say, look, they're trying to give the impression that everyone in the Persian Empire is on their side against the Jews. So they exaggerate their support. Everybody's with us, so why aren't you? Second, then they turn to slander God's people. Just look at how Jerusalem is described in verse 12 as a rebellious and a wicked city. Or again, look down to verse 15. Make a search in the archives of your predecessors. In these records, you'll find that this city is a rebellious city, troublesome to kings and provinces, a place with a long history of sedition, this is why this city was destroyed. See, they, uh, they slander. They don't really give any evidence for this, but they, they slander God's people. Then, cleverly, they play on the king's fears. And this is always a winner, isn't it? At first, they play on his fear of losing money. And which uh, government doesn't fear losing money? Verse 13 Furthermore, the king should know if this city is built and its walls are restored, no more taxes and tribute or duty will be paid and eventually the royal revenues will suffer. They know the way to get this king on side is to aim at his pocket. But they don't stop there. Next, they play on his fear of being dishonoured. Verse 14. Now, since we are under obligation to the palace and it is not proper for us to see the king dishonoured, We're sending this message to inform the king. No king wants to be seen to be dishonoured. And so they play on that fear. Then they play on his fear of losing territory. Verse 16. We inform the king that if this city is built and its walls are restored, you will be left with nothing in the trans-Euphrates. They are really good, aren't they? They know just what buttons to press. And so it is absolutely no surprise that King Artaxerxes quickly writes back on on their side. 
We see the summary of what he says, verse verse 21 over the page, chapter 4, verse 21. He says this, Now issue an order to these men to stop work so that this city will not be rebuilt until I so order. Be careful not to neglect this matter. Why let this threat grow to the detriment of the royal interests? Then we read, as soon as the copy of the letter of King Artaxerxes was read to Rahan and Shimshai the secretary and their associates, they went immediately to the Jews in Jerusalem and compelled them by force to stop. Satan is the father of lies. We should therefore not be, dis- not be surprised when we find the opponents of God's people lying, exaggerating, and slandering to turn the authorities against God's people. Again, just look at the Gospels, and we see that those are exactly the tactics that the Jewish leaders use against the Lord Jesus Christ when he's on trial before Pilate. They accuse him of being sedition, of leading a rebellion. They know what buttons to press. They lie. They twist so as to see him condemned. Those same sorts of tactics are used today as biblical Christianity is portrayed as abusive, as dangerous, as hateful, intolerant and out of step with British values. Well, in Ezra chapter 4, it all means that the chapter finishes on a very sad note. We've seen it already, but look again, verse 24. Thus the work on the house of God in Jerusalem came to a standstill until the second year of the reign of Darius, king of Persia. It feels bleak, doesn't it? As the work stops, as the gates to the building site are locked and the weeds begin to grow up, it does look like God's enemies have won. Now, I know that that's a fairly depressing place to end a sermon, isn't it? We want it all to finish on a happily ever after, But though this may be a depressing place to end a sermon, it is a realistic place to end a sermon. Because there are times when it feels like God's plans, God's building project has been thwarted. It felt like that on the evening of Good Friday, as the corpse of the Lord Jesus Christ was laid in a tomb. And as I stand here in this empty church building, It's hard not to feel like the building work of the church has come to something of a standstill. I'm actually recording this on Thursday morning. Ordinarily, I would not be able to stand here and do this because ordinarily on a Thursday morning, this building would be full of parents and little ones at Little Builders. It'd be full of people from the community coming in, making connection with the church and hearing something of the gospel. And yet this morning, it's just me stood talking to camera, my voice echoing around the room. This pandemic has not just uh, made it harder for us to meet together, to build one another up, and we long to do that. It's also made it much harder for us to reach out, uh, to share the gospel, to do evangelism, to invite people in. All our different outreach groups that have had to be put on hold. Satan... Satan loves to make us feel like we are in a a, a cul-de-sac, or you might say a graveyard of hopelessness. Because he knows that when we feel hopeless, well, that is when we are tempted to give up, to stop building, to stop trying to build each other up, to stop trying to see the church built as we share the gospel with others. So where can we go when we feel like we are in a graveyard of hopelessness? Well, I think we must keep going to the song that God's people sang at the end of chapter 3, that we heard them singing last week as they laid the foundation of the temple. It's there in chapter 3 and verse 11. Turn back and look with me. This is the song that we need to cling on to and we need to keep singing now, even when it feels hopeless. They sang to the Lord. He is good. His love towards Israel endures forever. Now that's the song that we need to hold on to. It's what we need to keep singing. Yes, when the building work is going well, the Lord is good and his love endures forever. 
And it's the song that we have to sing at times like this, when it feels like the building work has ground to a halt. Because here is what will keep us serving. Here's what will keep us building each other up and seeking to see the church built up as we each reach out with the gospel. The Lord is good. Not the Lord was good, but he is good. He's good today. He's good even when his plans seem to have been thwarted and his love endures forever. And that means that ultimately the enemy's schemes will fail. They will not last, but God's love, God's covenant faithfulness will endure. The Lord will keep his promises and he will do it in his time and he will do it in spite of all the opposition. As the Lord Jesus promises, he will build his church. He is building his church even today and not even sin and death and Satan can stop him. And so let me finish then with this this wonderful quote that I found this week from a great little commentary by a man called Bob File. And he said this, and I quote it to finish. When we come to an apparent graveyard of our hopes, we need to renew our trust in the God who knows his way out of the grave. We need to renew our trust in the Lord, the Lord who is good and the Lord whose love endures forever. Well, let's come to him and let's pray. Father, we want to thank you and praise you that you are indeed the Lord, the faithful God. You are the God whose love endures forever. You are the one who is good yesterday, today and forever. You are the one who has conquered the grave. Father, in the quietness of our hearts, we confess that At times, particularly at the moment, we are discouraged. We feel worn down. We feel timid. Some of us feel like giving up. Perhaps some of us even have. Father, please today and at this time, help us to renew our hope and our trust in you. Help us to hold tight to your love and your goodness. Please, through your word, keep the victory of the Lord Jesus Christ at his cross and the grave ever before our minds and renew our energy to keep serving, to keep building, even when we're tired and worn out. Help us to to keep serving and building each other up in love, however we're able to do it at the moment. And please, Father, give us the courage and the boldness to keep reaching out with the gospel to those around us so that we pray that your church might continue to be built up in maturity and also in numbers as others come and join us in bowing the knee to the Lord Jesus and worshipping him. And so we pray, please, all these things in Jesus' name and for his glory. Amen. On our own, we are weak so easily discouraged, left to ourselves we would give up, but because of the Lord's enduring love and goodness, we can sing now that Christ will hold us fast.
As we come to the end of this online service, let me just remind you that Zoom home groups will be happening this week. And let me encourage you to log on and join your group. I know meeting on Zoom is really not the same as uh, meeting face-to-face as we long to. But at the moment, at least, despite the frustrations, it is still a way that we can love one another and we can serve one another and we can build one another up as we, as we share together and as we pray for each other. So even if you've dropped out of the habit over the summer of, of logging on and joining your group, let me encourage you to do that this week as we, as we help one another to renew our hope in the Lord, as we remind one another of his love and his goodness that endures forever. And so now, may the Saviour, who died and rose and who reigns, grant you joy in the midst of your labour, peace in the midst of your troubles, hope in the midst of despair, and faithfulness in the midst of temptation. Amen.